have a good time Put a smile on your face, yeah Can't be caring, relation radio mm-hmm. Even brighten your day
And now it's time for our Faithful Financial Moments with Sister Sharon Richard. This is Sharon Richard with your Faithful Financing Moment. One of God's basic ways to provide for our needs is through work, an occupation through which we earn a living so that we are able to provide for ourselves and our families. Still, many don't make it a priority to get work and are comfortable with unemployment or simply working part-time to get by supplemented by other government financial support. In a recent position that I held, I was often asked to attend unemployment hearings for people that had left the company. It saddened me when I, I would hear from supervisors that the employee was speaking openly about preferring unemployment over working. It is this mindset that contributes to the debt crisis that our country faces today. Unemployment compensation is intended for those that truly have a desire and are actively seeking employment. When people abuse this, it costs all of us money and ultimately threatens the economy as a whole because taxes are imposed to cover these expenses. Higher taxes lowers the resources available to employ other people. This can be a vicious circle. We can no longer afford to finance those who choose not to work because of laziness. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 10 through 11, we are told, A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. God does expect us to work to provide for ourselves and our families. Yet some of us are not willing to work hard to maintain a job. Some quit jobs without a prospect for another job, and others become prideful about the type of work that they would be willing to do. Someone once told me that they didn't scrub floors or do fries. I looked at him and said, I will if that is what is necessary to take care of my responsibilities. This person had become comfortable living off of the hard work of someone else. When asked what they did with their day, I discovered that he spent his time watching television, taking himself to lunch with someone else's hard-earned money, and sleeping. He didn't realize that this behavior was a problem. Of course, there are times that we find ourselves unemployed, that is, to no fault of our own. Companies have downsized and redefined positions and effectively eliminated many jobs, particularly during this time of COVID-19. When we are faced with that challenge, treat each day as if you are still working. Start your day by continuing to get up early to visit job prospects complete online searches, and network with others that may be able to help you. Speak with your pastor, former coworkers, neighbors, and friends. You never know where your next position may be, but God will help you get there if you are diligent in your pursuit. This is Sharon Richard with your Faithful Financing Moment. Up next, Nina Taylor with Your Gospel News, followed by the Pastor's Corner with Elder Ernest Richard Jr., Apostle Irvin Whitlow, Apostle Vincent Smith, and company. Hi, everybody. I'm Nina Taylor, and here is Your Gospel News. Southern Gospel Group, the Williams Brothers, formerly known as the Little Williams Brothers and the Sensational Williams Brothers, formed the group in the 1950s in the siblings' hometown of Smithdale, Mississippi. The Williams Brothers were veteran performers by the time they released their first album in 1974. What's wrong with people today? Most of their sets either topped or came close to topping Billboard's Gospel Albums charts, including 1985's Blessed, which hit number one. In 1970, 
1972, the group founded BlackBerry Records, and their recording rate rapidly accelerated from the early 90s through the mid-2010s. They released over two dozen albums and maintained their presence on the gospel charts with releases like 1994's chart-topping Grammy Award-nominated In This Place, 2003's Still Here, and 2009's The Journey Continues. Their work has also been rewarded with almost 20 stellar awards and numerous nominations for Dove Awards. In 2017, they returned to the studio with the album Timeless, featuring the single What God Does. California native Renee Spearman is a Billboard chart-topping gospel artist and songwriter. She began her recording career in the late 1990s. The daughter of a pastor, she sang and was involved in her church's musical department at a very young age. In 1995, she led the Prosperity Crusade Choir on her recording debut, Change the World, a second album with the choir from a songwriter's perspective arrived in 1999. In 2001, Renee Spearman and Pres Blackman formed their own label, Black Spear Entertainment. A year later, the duo released Celebrate, an urban contemporary style gospel album accredited to Renee Spearman and Prez featuring Prosperity. It hit the top 30 of Billboard's gospel album charts in 2003 and remained on the charts for over 30 weeks. Another collaboration with Prez, He Changed Me, arrived on JDI Records in 2008, returned then to the gospel charts where it reached number 13. Spring is almost here, which means the fashion trends will be changing with the warmer weather. So this week, let's pay tribute to the black designers who have changed fashion history and paved the way for other creative people of color through their innovative designs. In the 1860s, Former Virginia-born slave Elizabeth Keckley became a personal dressmaker and close confidant of Mary Todd Lincoln, wife of Abraham Lincoln. Although her journey to the White House wasn't an easy one, Keckley finally brought her freedom from her St. Louis owners and then established herself as a skillful seamstress for the most influential women in Washington, D.C., as well as a civil activist and author. Born in Pennsylvania in 1905, Zelda Wynne Valdez lived during an era when racial segregation was part of daily life. She began as a storeroom worker in a boutique, eventually climbing her way up to seamstress. At the apex of her career, Valdez made clothes for Ella Fitzgerald and Maria Cole, Nat King Cole's wife. She designed Cole's famous off-the-shoulder wedding dress in 1948, the very same year in which she opened up her very own boutique. Anne Lowe was the first African-American to become a fairly renowned fashion designer from 1920 until the 1960s, Lowe's unique designs were worn by high society women. Lowe ultimately designed one of the most famous wedding dresses in history, the ivory silk taffeta bridal gown worn by Jacqueline Bouvier when she married John F. Kennedy in 1953. Unfortunately, Lowe never received credit from neither the press nor the first lady herself because of her race. In 1968, however, Lowe opened her store and Lowe Originals on Madison Avenue, and today her work is exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Here's this week's Top 10 Gospel Songs. Number 10, Travis Green featuring Doe, Good and Loved. 9, Nia Allen, Wait. 8, Brian Poppins featuring Tasha, Beautiful Savior. 7, CC Winans, Never Lost. 6. Tasha Cobbs Leonard, In Spite of Me. 5. Clark Sisters and Snoop Dogg with His Love. 4. Jokia, Yahweh. 3. Pastor Mike Jr., I Got It. 2. Corinne Hawthorne, Speak to Me. And our new number one song, yes, is the churchy song from Byron Cage, I Can't Give Up. Well, that's your top 10 songs, your tribute to African American designers, and your gospel news. I'm Nina Taylor, reminding you to connect with me on my website at msninataylor.com. Let's get back to more. More great gospel music on this great station. Hello, I'm Nina Taylor, your gospel news reporter, and you're listening to The Pastor's Corner with my friend, Elder Ernest Richard, on Elation Radio. Oh, and as always, you can hear my dear friend Nina Taylor along with that beautiful, beautiful, wonderful voice of our financial advisor, First Lady Sharon Richard, right here every day. Thank you for unmuting me, Sister Kimmy Kim. 
I'm going to ask that you come. No, I ain't going to mess with her today. Anyway, as I was saying, you can hear Nina Taylor and my wonderful wife, Sister Sharon Richard, every Thursday at 10 p.m. right here on the Gospel Coin. Well, welcome to you, to you, and also to you. I'm Pastor Ernest E. Richard, Jr., a.k.a. Preacher 719. And tonight we are going to have an open discussion uh, but it's going to be entailed, or it's going to be centered around something we've been talking about for a little while. Now, I do apologize for being off the air last week. I do. Uh, I'm, I'm on the road traveling. Right now, I am in the beautiful city of Hotlanta, uh, and uh, not that far from um, uh, from the Six Flags, I guess that's what it's called, that little amusement park. No, I'm not going there. I'm too old for that stuff. But nonetheless, we're down here in Hotlanta, and God has been good. We've been able to get here safely. Let me get my panel in here. Uh, I do want to say this. I want to thank each and every one of you, again, those of you who participated in our um uh, first year anniversary for Power to Stand Outreach Ministries, and if I didn't say it before, I want to let you know that First Lady Richard and I love you with the love of the Lord. Thank you so very much for all that you've done financially and your actual physical support, and to those who took the time to share a word, oh, my God. What a word, Bishop Jefferson, Apostle Don Skipworth, and Chief Apostle Vincent L. Smith. What a word, what a word. But listen, let's get our panel in here so we can get ready to get started. Up first, as always, he's been with me the longest. That's why I bring him in. You know, he's one of, he's uh, centered, he's rooted, he's grounded. He's so many great things in gospel. One thing is for sure, he's faithful, he's consistent, he loves the Lord with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And don't mind telling you about your nasty, dirty, disgusting self in a loving way, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please welcome Apostle Irvin A. Whitlow, Jr., so good to hear your voice, man. So good to hear your voice. I, I promise you. You know, but listen, let me get uh, 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 the second person in. Now, he's not the second longest. He's third, but I have to get him in because y'all know I got to save the best for last. Okay, this individual hails from the great state of Connecticut, the Elm City, better known as New Haven. Some call him the Pente- Pentecostal kid. I mean, others say he is wisdom on two feet for such a young man. He talks like he's been here before. Come on and let's welcome Chief Apostle Vincent L. Smith. If you don't. Know me by name. You will never, never, ever, ever know me. Oh, I'm sorry. Do we got to wear the monkey suits this time? <laughs> no, not this time. The Lord okay. bless everybody. It's just good to be on the line tonight, and we're ready to dive in to this wonderful pool. Of information. Amen. Coming up next, and I believe that she should be, if she may be with us, I pray that she is. I didn't get a message to say she would not be here, and I just happened to be in her neighborhood. I didn't even bother to call her to tell her I was here. But, you know, my apologies for that because in the process of trying to get your work done, the only thing you're thinking about, you're focusing on getting it done. But nonetheless, she is the newbie of the group. An excellent woman of God, powerful in the word, has no issues or problems laying down the gauntlet of the gospel if she has to. Y'all come on and let's welcome Minister Paula Henderson. Amen. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Bless the Lord, everyone. It's just a pleasure to be on the line with you all tonight. 
Amen, amen, amen. This next one is her twin. One throws a hard right, the other throws a quick left, and they will both knock you out in the words. If you come across them the wrong way, they will lovingly tell you to Indianapolis, Indiana. Y'all, please welcome my other sister from another mother, pastor, recently deemed pastor, associate pastor at Jerusalem Temple, Pastor who Anna Henderson. Anna, I had to think of your name for seven seconds. Please forgive me. <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, man. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, and oh, blessed is the man that trusted in him. I am so glad to be on this podcast tonight. So looking forward to the discussion in Jesus' name. Hey, many, 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 many. Before I introduce this uh, last individual, now we did have a discussion earlier, so I mean, hopefully she can pop in real quick and say hello. Uh, let me do it this way. Without her, we can't get much of anything done. Batting clean up and swinging for the fences, as always, is none other than Dr. Kim Robinson. How you doing, my sister? I'm good. I'm just in classes right now. Okay. Well, I know you said you would be, and I thank you for taking seven seconds. I know if she gets a chance to be with us, she'll be there, and if not, we understand. Give yourself a hand clap. Now, I want to check to see if there's anybody else on the line that we may have missed, someone that may have decided to join us today and be part of our open discussion. Is there anyone else on the line that we need to address? And you all have to notice I'm being kind of sedated today because, I mean, uh, the Lord had to sort of kind of humble me in a total different way. I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Anyone else? Okay, no one else. Listen, I want to take a minute to speak to you and have a, 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 a conversation with you about something. But before we do, I'm going to ask uh, Minister Paula Henderson to uh, to uh, hold, to pray us in. And then I'm going to ask uh, uh, Apostle Whitlow if you'll get me Second Samuel, if you'll get me Second Samuel, uh, the second chapter, Second uh, Samuel chapter two. Uh, where is it? I just had it. Okay, Second Samuel chapter two started uh, verse Second cha- Samuel chapter eleven. Get that. I got to put myself on mute for a minute because someone has to speak to me. So, Sister uh, uh, Vet Pastor uh, Minister Henderson, pray us in, and Apostle Whitlow. Give us uh, that scripture. Amen. Father God, we come to you right now in the precious and matchless name of Jesus. We just thank you, Lord God, for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come together to discuss uh, your word. Lord God, we just pray that as we have this discussion, that there might be something said that would draw someone closer to you, that that would give someone more understanding, that might encourage someone. Lord God, we just bless you for all the things you've done and for being a mighty God. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we give you all glory, praise, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen and amen and thank God. Well, I've been asked to read 2 Samuel chapter 11. He didn't tell me how many verses, so I'm just going to read until he gets back. It says, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. It came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. I hear you, dude. I hear you. And David sat and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, 
the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war fostered. David said okay. to Uriah, oh. Okay. I've read no, the way. Finish, finish that. Yeah, no, finish that, that, that particular verse. scripture. I'm sorry. And David said unto Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. When they had told David, saying Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open field. Shall I then go into my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As thou livest, as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. David said to Uriah, tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him and made him drunk. And at even... He went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. What do you say? And it came to pass All right. in the morning that David led it to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Final verse, uh, it said, and he wrote the letter in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. <laughs> the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. And I know I do. Uh, I, I, I'm in the process of uh, taking care of business here, so I'm going to have to kill two birds with one stone, and here we go. Tonight, we've been talking over the last uh, few weeks about uh, deliverance. It's a process. But in the process of talking about deliverance being a process, we never got to the place and point where we would find out why would an individual need deliverance? Why would an individual have to process through deliverance? So tonight, and I'm going to allow uh, and ask Apostle Whitlow for a few minutes more to carry this for me. Tonight, and I don't know if we want to go, we want to talk about dirty laundry. <laughs> Yeah, I said it. We want to talk about dirty laundry. Too many of us have put ourselves in a position where we're trying to hide things and not let the rest of the world find out where we are and what we're doing and how we're doing it. And our dirty laundry is put away where nobody can see it. And then and we get in some situations and circumstances where we have folk, once they get mad with you and they know about your dirty laundry, they want to make sure it's aired out there for all the world to see. Everybody remembers the Jim Baker and the uh, uh, Jimmy Swaggart situation and what happened in that. So from that point, Apostle Whitlow, let's just jump from there. Give me a few more minutes, and I will be ready to get in this conversation because I want to hear what the rest of the world thinks about dirty laundry. Well, man, you you done put something on me now. You done put something on me. But when we think about the daily line,
Hello, God bless you. I'm here talking. I thought y'all were listening to me. Amen. But I said I was saying that it's amazing how here's a man who supposedly belongs to God. But while he belongs to God, he's got a devil in him. I want to get your thoughts on that before we even go any further. People who are serving God, yet they have a devil. Would you talk to me, Pastor Henderson? Amen. Repeat that again. People who are serving God. At least that's what they're supposed to be doing, yet they have a devil. Well, um, our discussion has been talking about the process or deliverance being a process. Um, and we're talking in, in time past about the unregenerated man uh, versus the generated man. and um, regenerated man and spiritually so um, I think that I, I think that that in the process of in the, in the process of living this life as a Christian uh, being born again uh, every day the Bible tells us to die daily so it is a process as far as walking this journey with Christ. And I believe that as we continue to walk with him, then we begin to shed those things that are unlike him. Uh, Although we are challenged, uh, uh, as Paul says, you know, on on every side, we have our challenges, but we have um, power within to overcome as believers. Uh, Nevertheless, we still have challenges that afflict the body and afflict the soul and can afflict the spirit that causes one to find themselves in precarious situations that causes them possibly to be living from the carnal side or living out of the carnal realm versus living out of the spiritual realm of their spiritual identity. Um, And uh, and we talked about that. Uh, as far as when Paul was saying the good that he would do, he found, you know, the good that he wanted to do, he didn't do, and the things that he didn't want to do, he found himself doing. Um, and so I, I think that um, that in this process, in, in in this process, that we are being saved. You know, we, we have been saved from sin. When we first receive the Lord Jesus Christ into our life, we are saved. We can make confession. We can from those things. And we are saved from sin and washed in the blood of the, of the Lamb. And the process comes that we are being saved, that we are continuing to be saved on a, on a daily basis. We are continuing to overcome the sin nature uh, every single day. So that's where the process is <laughs> being saved. We are in the process of being saved every day. We are, it's a continual progressive salvation because we are constantly shedding are those final things from the old man that we may may come up higher to live in a spiritual realm. So um, that's my perspective. I'm trying to remember, actually, the actual question. I'm going to have to admit that I'm a little sleepy tonight. Um, But I I think that we are being saved. We're in the process of being saved until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back when we will be saved uh, from from the earthly realm, from the carnal realm, we will be saved eternally when he comes back. But at this time, until he comes back, we're in the process of being saved each and every day, and we are dying daily. So I'm going to put a period there and kind of shake myself and get myself ready for the next question. Apostle Smith, talk to me. What do you think? People being saved, yet they got a devil. Ask that question again. I said, tell me your thoughts on people who are saved, yet they have a devil. I don't know if you want to hear 
I don't even know if you want to hear me answer that. Um, because you can't be saved and have the devil. He said you're going to love one and hate the other. You're going to cleave to one and shun the other. Uh, you can't have, as the old saying goes, you can't have your cake and eat it too. There must be a decision. According to Scripture, there must be a decision whether if you're going to follow Jesus or follow the devil. A person that has received Jesus might have a bad moment, but you cannot be saved. At, but let me put it like this. You cannot be the property of Jesus and the devil at the same time. One or the other is in charge of your life. Either you're striving to be saved or you are working for the enemy. So, therefore, I don't believe you can be saved and have or be the devil at the same time. Now, now let's look at this again. I want you to think about what you just said because, again, here is a man who was after God's own heart. This is what the Bible said. I didn't write this. I didn't make this up. The Bible said this is a man after God's own heart. But when we read this text, this man had a devil. Well, when you read this text, I, I, this I, man I, had I, a devil. I'm going to go another route on that. I will agree he had a devil. And he was a man after God's own heart. But we must remember salvation had not come in yet. The work of salvation had not been done yet. And so he had he didn't have just a devil. Much like Samson, David had a flesh problem. He just loved women. And he never tried to correct his flesh problem. His deliverance, his deliverance had nothing to do with save or unsave. His deliverance was in himself. He had a problem with women. We talk about Solomon. But most of the women that Solomon had, he inherited from his daddy. His daddy had a flesh problem. Not a problem loving Jesus or loving God, as we might say. Uh, his problem was in his flesh. So, then, then, then. Then, if he had a problem, I want to make sure I understand. I want to make sure I understand you. All right, Pastor, uh, Minister Paula, uh, get ready. I'm coming to you. But Apostle, I want to make sure I understand you. That you said these are the key things you said. That salvation had not yet come, and he was a man after God's heart, but he had a he had a flesh problem. Is that what you said? He had a sex problem. Even if you remember, I don't want to go too far over, but I need to pull this out right now. He had such a sex problem that when he died, they brought a young damsel into his room, laid her mm -hmm. at his feet, laid her at his feet in his in his bed. And when he didn't make a move at her, the servant said, oh, he did. <laughs> he had a sex problem so bad that if you brought a woman around him, he was going to do something with her. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't up for so rubber good. feet, he was going to do something to that woman. When they laid that little young so girl good. in there and 
pretty as she was, and David didn't do nothing, they said, oh, he did. Mm-hmm. So then the question, so then let me ask this one question. Let me ask this question. So if he belongs to God and he has a sex problem, mm-hmm. is that not devil? Because uh, you can't tell me, you can't tell me that if you belong to God, you're supposed to have a sex problem. Um, can well, I jump well, in on I this? Said, well, then tonight, Apostle, I, I, I think I think we better end this podcast now because nope. most of the folks I know in Christendom have some kind of flesh problem. Even if Amen. They, they talk too much. If it ain't talking uh-huh. too much, they eat too much. If they don't eat too much, they gossip too much. So I guess we got a lot of same folks with adults. If, if, if we're going to call it. If we're going to call it a devil, I, I think that's where I, I think that's where me and you are having this discussion at on that terminology, a devil. I, I, I think really it's a less struggle. So when you talk about having a devil, now you're talking about possession and ownership. By Satan, but there are mm-hmm. flesh there are flesh troubles that can come from you, and the devil don't even have to push it. It's because you won't maintain yourself. All right. Is the there de- any the way I can get in the middle of this conversation? The devil don't have to come in nobody's bedroom and pull your drawers and panties down. And say, lay in that bed and do what you're doing. That's a choice. Amen. That's a blessing. Amen. Now the devil may be in the background somewhere, but it's not. It's not a. It's not a possession. That is a matter of choice. And, and God gave us the matter of choice, but. To say that it is to be saved and to say somebody has a devil, then we start talking about the dawn of the oxymoron. Okay. <laughs> all right. Can well, I throw something in there? But I know you guys, can you guys hear me first of all? Listen, and I know we're all... Bouncing back and forth. I know you got a question for uh, for Minister Henderson. I don't want to interrupt that flow. But when we turn around and talk about having a devil, I would simply say this, and Paul backs it up the best in Galatians chapter 5 when he talks about uh, the battle between the battle of the flesh versus the spirit. And Gentlemen, let's just be real about this. If we're going to sit here and talk about this subject and make any kind of noise concerning this subject, we are all in a situation where there is a battle. With, I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how many decades you've been walking in the Word. The truth of the matter is your spirit got 100% saved. Your flesh is still a work in progress. I don't think I would say uh, that there that he has a devil. I will say he has a problem with his flesh, and that has already been established. But what I'm really looking at, uh, what I'm really looking at is something. When I talk about dirty laundry, there is something uh, authentic about what's going on. And I chose these particular passages of scripture because there's a lot when you look at it. To be uh, to be said here. So let me do this, Apostle Whitlow. Let me let you ask Minister Henderson her question, and then I want to throw something at you because I really want to get into the heart of why that subject was charged was 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 chosen. There is something that we as Christians have to pay attention to. A lot of us we get into sin, we get into wrongdoings, we get into works of iniquity, and if nobody physically sees us, 
We go on like there's nothing wrong. And we'll throw a super lame apology to God, Lord, forgive me, and walk away like nothing happened. There wasn't an ounce of sincerity in that anywhere. And I mean nowhere. You know it and God knows it. But because nobody else physically saw you do what you did, whatever it may have been, you figure you're in the clear. That nobody paid attention. But the scripture is plain and simple when it says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro. He's always seeking to see who he may show himself strong to. But in the process of showing himself strong, don't think for 35 seconds he doesn't see your little sin. He doesn't see your little dirt. Don't think he doesn't see your secret sins. David even mentioned it in the Psalms about his secret sins. All right? So let me let you uh, ask Minister Henderson her question, and then I, w- I, w- I want to wrap at this, cut, throw at this for a few minutes. Uh, the only, uh, again, there are so many things at this, and when you talk about dirty laundry, when you, when you talk about dirty laundry, then you talk about the things that people don't want to talk about. You talk about things that exist that should not be an issue. There are certain things that the Scripture tells us that we know, uh, 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 for instance, I believe what, what uh, Pastor Anna said when she said that, you know, while deliverance is a process, we're being saved in stages. We were saved mm-hmm. from the penalty of and, and and whatnot, but yet we're being saved now from the returning of the habit, and we will be saved in the future in the sense of total conformity. But, but here's a man who there's none other like him. The Bible declares that he's a man after God's own heart. Mm-hmm. But in that, he's got a devil that's got him doing things that he should not be doing after when he's a man after God's own heart. So, uh, Minister Paula, you, you've been hearing a lot of things that we've been saying, and I know there's something that you wanted to say, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to express yourself before we went any further. Anywhere, any direction you want to go, we want to give you that opportunity to express yourself. Amen. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, so just in looking at this particular scenario or passage of Scripture in terms of David, I, I really find ironic that this is the same David, as you said, that. Uh, had a heart after God's own heart, and it's the same David that played music, and he chased the devil out of Saul. Um, The same David that was anointed is the same David that became king, and also he he succumbed to this particular temptation of his flesh. Um, I think we can find, in my opinion, and understanding of what was happening in the book of James where it says that um, when you are tempted, it is because you are drawn away by your own evil, evil desires that are and you're lured away and you're enticed by those evil desires that are within you. So even though he had a heart after God's own heart and he was anointed, there was still something in him that enticed him, and he was lured away by the lust of the flesh. We saw the same thing that happened with even Eve, you know, in the Garden of Eve, she was lured away um, from God. And I think that one thing that we need to also think about is how, uh, you know, as far as sin, and basically when when sin is conceived, um, you know, it's because we've been drawn away from God. And, um, you know, the Bible tells us, you know, we are to confess our sins or our faults one to another. Uh, we're talking about hidden sin. We have to confess those faults. It doesn't mean you have to give your details of your intimate life, I don't believe, to anyone. But sometimes it's good even within the church to have some sort of a support system because if you know you're weak in one area, it might be good for you to, you know, to go to your pastor or go to a confidant, someone who is stronger in that area to help you be able to sustain yourself so that when you are tempted because we are also flesh, then you have some sort of support system to keep you on the right path because we're flesh but we're spirit. Our spirit man should be edified all the more so even 
the Bible says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together, all the more you see the day of the Lord coming. So it's a need for us to come together and support each other to make sure that we're not falling by the wayside and being drawn away and tempted. So does he have a devil? I don't know that it's so much of a devil as opposed to he was drawn away by something that was inside of him. And I, I don't think it was to the point where he became reprobate, um, where, you know, because when you become reprobate, then, then at that point you give yourself away. If you continue in something and use grace as an excuse to continue, then at that point I believe that you can get to a point where you can come up under some sort of demonic oppression to something because you, you stayed in it and you didn't get yourself up out of it. So that's just okay. some of my thoughts. All right. That. All right. All right. And I I got the chance to hear what you're saying. And yeah, I have to agree with you there. But I want to show you something. All right. Now when we're talking about dirty laundry, uh I wanna make sure let's make this crystal clear. Naturally speaking, when we talk about dirty laundry, we're talking about soiled clothing, clothing that may have been worn, that may have got messed up in the process of doing something, and things of that nature. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, our spirit, as I said earlier, is actually uh, made perfect. And it is the flesh that we have to spend the most of our time trying to overcome. I heard somebody make mention of Romans 7 where Paul said, the thing that I want to do, I don't seem to be doing, and the thing I have no desire to do, I seem to always find myself doing. In this particular story, I want to show you something. Look at, uh, let's look at verse 11, uh, chapter 11. It came to pass after the year, this is the New International Version. It came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings, when kings go forth to battle. And David said, Joab, all right, A number one, when we are in leadership and we are not in our right positions, we are literally positioning ourselves to be caught in the middle of something that would otherwise compromise our character and who we are. David, in this case, sends Joab and his servants that are with them, meaning with Joab and all the men of Israel who were fighting battle. And they did their job. They destroyed the children of Ammon. They besieged Rabbah. David tarried still in Jerusalem, meaning David stayed home that particular day. I don't know if he was tired, a little weary. David had been battling for a number of years. But now look at what verse 2 says. It came to pass in an even tide that David arose from his bed. David had laid down to get himself a little bit of rest and became restless. I guess I could use that word. Does that make sense to anybody? And in the process of becoming restless, David got himself up. And look at what happens. He began to walk on the roof of his house. They had a flat top roof. And the roof from that roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Now, I know we can get spiritual because we weren't back in that day and the Holy Spirit hadn't come. And we can go into the book of Matthew where Jesus said on one occasion, whoso looketh upon a woman to lust after her has already committed a tree in their heart. And the word is absolute 100% right. But in talking about dirty laundry, dirty laundry has to get soiled some kind of way. So here we are in the first phase right here. We can look at this. David in his restlessness, and I don't know about you, but I'll speak for me. Any time that I'm restless, sin is just around the corner. I don't want nobody on this line and nobody listening to us to ever think that when you're having a restless moment, when you're having a moment of anxiety, when you're having a moment, you're not praying and you're not seeking the face of God. You're just having one of those me moments, I like to call them. Don't think for 35 seconds sin isn't crouching somewhere like a tiger on its prey, waiting for an opportunity to pounce. Somebody made mention of the, of the process of temptation. When a man uh, is, is tempted, he is drawn away of his own lust. 
and enticed. He looks from his roof, sees this woman washing herself, and find, and he could see that she's shapely. He could see that she's well-developed. Let's just be real here, saints, because too many of us, we kind of skim through this story and act like none of this stuff has ever taken place. We skim through it. Bathsheba was, if I could give Bathsheba, and I'm just using this so we can get a picture in our mind. Whom would you consider to be a very, and please, don't nobody say Michelle Obama. Yes, she is beautiful, but we're not talking that kind of beautiful right now, okay? So think in your mind whom you would deem a beautiful woman, and that will give you a small glimpse of an idea of what David was looking at in his restlessness while walking on the roof of the king's house. He looked upon Bathsheba with her super beautiful self. And verse 3 says that David inquired and sought and asked, who, who that? Who's that woman? Bro, or bro, in the bro, words of the, the let, go ahead. Before, before you get too, 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 too far down in the scripture, I think it's important that we look at verse 1. Verse mm-hmm. 1 says, it was the time. Mm-hmm. When kings would go to war. Mm-hmm. Notice that now. It was mm-hmm. the time. When you look in scripture and it starts talking about time, that mm-hmm. that is important. That means there was a set season. That's right. That they expected kings to go out and fight against and each other to, to, mm-hmm. to take over ter- territory, take over goodies, and all of that. It said it was a time for the kings to be at war, but, uh-oh, David stayed on. Come on. Really, really, verse 1 it, it, it is the strength of the story before you even get what the story is going to tell you. It lets uh-huh. you know in one that David had set up something in himself. He was tired when he got there. His tiredness wasn't his body. His tiredness was, wow. I'm tired of seeing this woman at times when I'm at home. And I can't get none. <laughs> I'm going to say this, Apostle Smith, and thank you uh, for sharing that. Yeah, the time uh, when kings went for David's tiredness. Now, you say his tiredness was the very, well, let's just talk raw. He wasn't getting none. He, he, you know, he, and see, ladies, let me share something with y'all. Y'all, he, Okay, I don't want to get myself into too much trouble, but I'm getting ready to step out there like right about now, and I hope y'all respond and come at me big time. Just as you women have your time of the month and you have your particular season when you don't feel like yourself, you feel a little different and in some cases a little extra, we men also have times and seasons in our lives. David had been battling for such a long time. He didn't just start. David started out as a worshiper and became a warrior. David did not come out as a warrior. We can go back to the story of Goliath. He went out to take some food to his brothers, became indignant at what Goliath was saying. The next thing you know, the boy was in the fight of his life, and the truth of the matter is he had that confidence and trust in the God of his salvation that he wasn't even worried. He didn't even have a second thought about losing. He didn't say, didn't write a will in case I lose, brothers. You can have the sheep and you can have my staff and you can have my bag with my rock and my sling. He didn't go through all that. He did what he had to do. So David was a worshiper before he became a warrior. Now we get to a season and I'm going to wild guess this. I could be dead wrong in what I'm about to say and if I am, 
somebody please prayerfully and carefully and tactfully correct me. I'd like to believe that in the winter season, the time when it was cold and barren, most kings sat down with their people and planned their attacks on who they were going to go after and what they were going to take. That time or season when they went forth to battle, I'd like to believe was in the springtime, the time to uproot, the time to pluck up, the down, that time to destroy. David, in this particular case, says, God, I, I, I need a break. I just, I just need a break. And sends Joab in his place. Come on. You about to say? Okay, I thought you were about to say something, Apostle Smith. But anyway, David just turns around and he sends Joab and, jo- and his servants with him. He sends his servants with Joab to go out with the men to do battle. Now, the men go out to do their job. They're on a business-as-usual routine in the destruction of, uh, of Ammon and besieging Rabbah, which is one of the fortified cities uh, uh, of the Ammonites at that particular time. But David didn't ride with them this time. David did not lead the charge. Let me tell you something, whoever is listening to us right now. If you are in leadership, know the outcome of the battle is not predicated on whether you lead the charge. The outcome of the battle really has to do with your focus on the one who's giving you the directions and the commands as to how the war or the battle ought to be fought. So what I'm looking at here is, as you said, David was uh, had his mind on something else. I'd like to believe that this became a distraction when David went out on his roof, when he got up out of his bed, and I've done this a few times. I can remember times uh, when God was speaking to me about different things. I would wake up 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and it's like I can't stay in the bed. I've, I didn't always have a war room. We have one now so I could go down there and pray. But I would walk around the house. There were times I would get in my car and just drive. And I'm going to be very candid right here. Judge me if you feel like it. This is past life. God has forgiven me. If you want to harp on it, you stay there. And when Jesus comes back and you're still there, you just miss heaven. So let's move forward. Let's go ahead and do it. Uh Go ahead and say it. (laughs) Uh Look, look. Don't cause me to come up there and upset St. Louis. Okay, let me move on. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is simply this. There was a time I went out, and the person that I saw when I was out in the street, now if you know anything about New Haven, Apostle Smith, you already know, Edgewood Avenue, uh, a very dear friend of ours, I'm going to say it like this, Apostle Smith, her brother was somewhat prominent in the city of New Haven at a very prominent church in the New Hallville area. You read between the lines. I'm not going to put her name out there, but I happened to run into this individual while I was out there at that particular time, and I couldn't understand why she was out there. And, he, and you know what Edward Avenue was after, in, in, after dark, so let's not go too far with that. We had opportunity to sit down and a chance to talk, but when the police rolls up on you, all they can see is what they think is a John and a prostitute. And so they're going to go through the process of badgering you, thinking that you're out there trying to buy sex. When At that time, I was talking to a friend of ours who was in church, you know, who was in church. Well, she wasn't in church at that time. But the truth of the matter is, I mean, looks are deceiving. My point is simply this. Sometimes you can get restless to the point where you could be out there and sin is always crouching at the door, always waiting. In David's case, we see sin crouching at the door as he watches off of the roof a woman washing herself. And the reason why I was getting a little deeper because there was something else that was going on here. And I want to get into this and go back over it. Because of the fact that uh, he saw her washing and she was beautiful to look upon, David asked who it is, and they said, this is Bathsheba. This is the wife of, uh, uh, of Uriah. This is the daughter of Eliam. Uh, now, David sends a messenger to tell her to come to him. And she came and she laid with him. But get this, in verse 4, here is another sin. And some of you all have already read Levitical law and you've read it in the book of Deuteronomy, that a woman, according to the law, was not to be touched seven days after her purification process. 
Now, David takes this woman and has sex with her, and she has not completed her purification process. Am I being proper, ladies, when I speak of this? Y'all talk to me. Am I keeping it clean? Y'all better say something because yes. I'm going to get raw in a minute. I heard You're Kim fine. and Kim. You're uh, fine. You're good looking too, but I was asking about this. You too. Anyway, the bottom line is, according to Levitical law, that uh, seven days, It's uh, I believe it's supposed to be a total of, I could be wrong on the day count. I think it's a total of 14 days after a woman's menstrual cycle has completed that she is not to be sexually touched. Because in touching her, uh, according to the law, you are still dabbing in the blood. And you already know what the word said about dealing with blood uh, uh, in an unholy way. The bottom line is this. David already commits in his mind an adulterous act. And now he is drawing Bathsheba in to commit uh, another type of sin. And together they commit one, a third type of sin, which is, in this case, well, it should be adultery for both of them because she has a husband, he has wives, and this wasn't one of them. So let's go back over this and let, let, let's pull this thing apart, okay? In a time of anxiousness, in a time of anxiety, in a time – when you're restless, when it seems like uh, you just don't quite seem to have that connection with the Lord. Anybody got any suggestions of what to do in a time like that? Or has anybody besides me ever been in a time like that? You have to come in and surrender. You ask for mercy is what I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, keeping it 100, I mean, we can pretend like we are holding it down, but we're not. And so when you're real with God, he will come for, to your rescue. You have some people who just aren't I'm, – I'm, I'm going to be honest. Um, I can be real with myself because I know God is, is sanctifying me daily, every day. I am not mm-hmm. how I used to be on yesterday, and I am growing. So when you're at a uh, relationship, a true relationship with God, you can be – true to yourself. You can say, hey, I did those things, but I'm not what I used to be. I'm no longer like that because God has changed me. When you can really have a story like that, that's when God will deal with you. That's why, of course, there'll be consequences and things like that, but God knows your heart. He knows your mind. He knows everything. He knows what you're going to do before you actually do it. So when you're actually real with him, it is so. It is so. I mean, it seems like like stress. It's like we left it. You can be yourself because he knows you anyway. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow. <laughs> All right, so now that's let's, why let's, I can let's, truly say keep it at one hundred with him. Like you just pray and say, God, I have that. a sex issue. God, I have a drinking issue. God, I have a money uh, issue. God, I have a gambling issue. But look I mean, what you're if doing. you're real with him, look what you're doing, sis. Yes. You're acknowledging that you have this issue. Do you know there are folk out there, and I'm talking Christians, who have a difficult time acknowledging their sins, shortcomings, wrongdoings. But he says to confess your sins to him. Yeah, but that's the word says to confess confess it. But all right, but look at it this way. I mean, what is it? What? Why is it so difficult for us to tell God? We act like God don't know what our secret sins are, and I'd say everybody on this line has what we call "quote unquote" a secret sin, something that only you and God know about, and nobody else but you and God. Yeah. Okay. Amen. When I was a lot. I was a lot I was a lot younger uh and this is before I got saved. If I had been saved at age 16, 17, 18, my secret sin and no and ladies, I'm going as wide open and transparent as possible because I am so sick and tired of Christians trying to hide behind the curtain of grace. If you're going to hide, mm-hmm. at least get cleaned up before you go hide yourself. Because that's why Jesus died, so that you could be washed of your sin. He was hung up for your hang-ups. 
and a lot of us don't want to yeah. go ahead and be real. But when I was a youngster back in my teens, I had a small issue with masturbation. If I couldn't get none, I took care of myself. Now, I'm being real. Now, I don't want everybody to sit there, oh, my God. No, oh, my God, my foot. Wake up. Stop acting like you're so holier than now. Some of and y'all you know might what? have been dead. De- Go ahead. Go ahead. Those are the Pharisees and the Sadducees that he talks about in the um, – they say, I do this, I do this, but they don't really acknowledge him in a relationship basis. Because when you have a relationship but, with the Lord, you can confess anything to him. And so – one thing I love about real people is that they have so much peace on them. They they Thank you. they have a true relationship. They can go to him in prayer and knowing. Don't get me wrong. We I I mean I feel bad when I do wrong. Don't get me wrong, but it's amazing to have that peace and knowing that he knows your heart and he really does know your heart. So. Amen. Anybody want to jump in on this discussion? It's wide open. Well, one thing I, I'd like to say is, I mean, it's clear that, you know, the Bible says no man, everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we all know True. that, you know, everybody has sinned at some point in time in their life. You wouldn't be human if you didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, however, you know, one thing I liked about when um, the woman was caught in the act of adultery uh-huh. and all of, she was brought before all of her accusers, you know, and... And when Jesus bent down, you know, he was God and man. I'm sure he could see what she looked like. She was brought naked before them. Yet he, he bent down and he began to write in something in the sand. And all of her accusers began to drop their rocks away. Um, I think part of that was to show that everyone had something. Everyone had something that they might have done at some point in time that they may have also been guilty of. Um, but he told the woman to go and sin no more. Um, as often he you told that to, yeah. So, um, so, so part of your deliverance, getting back to deliverance, is 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 going going away from that path as much as possible. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. Um, I know um, it's kind of like when you're bodybuilding. Okay, you might start out with a five pound weight, then you go to twenty, then you build yourself up till you get to a certain weight. Uh, category so i mean it, it's a process in terms of building because even the bible says to build yourself up um in the faith so we are to build ourselves up in the faith so that we can grow in godliness grow in in your mind and the consciousness of this those things that are of the spirit so that your spirit man can become stronger so when you get out side of your little proximity where you feel like, hey, I'm safe from the temptation, but then you can go into another area and still be strong enough if your spirit is man is built up to withstand the temptation. And if you know that you're, mm-hmm. okay, you're not at that level yet, then you, you you avoid those things, you know, that you know, you know, don't go into a bar, you know, you, you can't abstain from, you know, drinking alcohol, that type of thing. But it's a process of building yourself up in God and in godliness and, and making that decision that I want to live for God. Uh, it, it, it's okay. going to be a struggle at first, but you can get there. Well, all right. Well, now, you said an awful lot in that process. So let, let, let's try to back up just a little bit, and let's go back to your opening statement. Of course, we know we've all sinned and we've all come short of God's glory. It's just our basic human nature. We learn that about ourselves. In those areas, as born and see, I want to talk to the unbeliever, to the one who's not saved, as well as to the Christian, because a lot of times we want to spend exorbitant amounts of time ministering to the saved, and we leave the unsaved uh, you know, un- I don't want to use the word church. We leave those who are not saved without opportunity to present themselves before the Lord. You see, the main thing we've got to pay attention to, and thank you so very much, my sister, for all that you just shared with us, but our main focus in terms of us uh, conforming to the image of Christ, we know about those those little idiosyncrasies in our lives. Now, here's where it gets tough. A pedophile is not going to confess his faults to somebody else. 
and ask for prayer because he knows he's he, in his mind he feels like he's going to be judged and he's going to somebody's going to play jury and somebody might even try to play execution. I'm just throwing a few things out there so we can see what it is we're dealing with in today's society. Someone that's battling homosexuality is not going to come uh, going to admit that they are in fact a homosexual. They may not even admit that they have a problem with having sex with someone of the same sex. They may not. We will keep these things covered as long as we can. And the sad part is when somebody exposes what we've been doing all this long time, we're angry, we're embarrassed, we're humiliated, we want revenge, we're looking for the big payback, when all we really had to do was go to God in prayer, ask for his help, ask God to ask the Holy Spirit to send someone who has been through what you've been through to help you to come out of what it is that you've been through and not send you to some weakling who's been through what you've been through, and then all of a sudden the next thing you know, you're back in it with them. Where we have to understand dirty laundry, we have to understand that somebody just said it a few minutes ago. It may have been you, Minister Paula. It may have been you, Dr. Robinson. We really, really have to come to God and sit down. And that Romans 7, somebody mentioned earlier this evening, we got to recognize, God, I'm in a battle. This thing is, I don't want to lose this thing. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm still, and I'm going to say this, I so bless God for where he has myself and my wife, but I could do, uh, oh, I could do so much better in the area of finances. I started noticing how much money I waste. God blesses me to get a good amount of money to do a lot of things. And I just, I would say in the last two weeks, I've been paying attention to how much money I can waste. Now, to somebody else, that's not much of anything. But you know what? How about the individuals that don't have a or a sixteenth of what God has blessed me with? Couldn't I have done something better with that than wasted on something useless? Am I making sense? I mean, everybody's super quiet, like we're in a, a, a classroom in a lecture section. I don't want this to be a lecture session. I want this to be an open discussion. If we're going to talk about dirty laundry, I want to talk about the problem, and then I want to talk about how can we rectify these problems. We chose David because of the many things that you see in here, the restlessness of it, the rest of his mind, his lack of desire to go to work, his uh, peeping Tom abilities from off of his roof, watching a woman who's just coming off her period wash herself. He sends for the woman. The woman shows up. She could have said, I do have a husband, and this would not be the perfect thing to do. She probably had opportunity to tell him it wouldn't be good for us to have sex, and she would not have been in violation of anything at least not under the law anyway. Uh, Meanwhile, her husband is... Go ahead. If we we really look into this scripture, Mm -hmm. and I know we're just dealing uh, with the basics of of how it came about, but when you really Mm -hmm. hide into this scripture... It's not until later on in the scripture that verse 1 starts to unveil. Uh Uh-huh. Because when he finds out she's pregnant, Mm -hmm. and then he wants to have a conversation with her. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. not saying it the way it's written, but saying it in our language. She said mm-hmm. to him, I told you I didn't want to come over to your house in the first place. That's a possibility. See, no, no, it's in the scripture. It's in the scripture. She said, I told you I didn't want to come. And I'm going to say, she knew she was obligated. Uh Uh-huh, exactly. She knew. (laughs) If y'all really, (laughs) I I just want to throw this out there. Really, as you get deeper and deeper into this scripture, it it sort 
ever shine the light that this was not the first time that David mm-hmm. and Bathsheba got together. That's what something to think was. about. That's what this text starts to show you. That it wasn't their first time getting together. This time they got caught by way of a baby. Mm-hmm. And, and really, when you start talking about dirty laundry and being delivered, See, there are things that we throw. There are things that we throw in our dirty laundry, not just because mm-hmm. it needs to be cooking. Some stuff we throw in the laundry trying to hide anybody from seeing mm-hmm. that we did something like that with our clothes. Come on now. Mm-hmm. Come on, spiritually mm-hmm. speaking, and mm-hmm. are or do we not still see these things in this day and age? I mean, uh, I'm just learning. But uh, oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm a. I know I'll get in trouble for this, but that's quite all right. I'm learning of self-appointed overseers, self-appointed bishops, self-appointed apostles, people whom God did not call to those offices, did not anoint, neither did God appoint, but somehow they managed to set themselves in that office without any rebuttal from the people. So my challenge and my question here, and I'm hoping somebody will answer me because we got about eight or nine minutes left. At what point after seeing uh and I hope y'all get a chance to read this whole in this entire chapter because there's quite a bit in there that needs to be discovered and uncovered. But at what point do we begin to deal with getting ourselves in a good position or getting ourselves in in right standing with God? I know the Bible says to everything there is a time and a season. And when you talk about times and you talk about seasons, you are talking about a period of life when you make a decision to make change. So at what point do we change some of those things in our lives? What do we do? The thing that I I don't want to do – go ahead. Go ahead. I I think Go ahead. The, I think the Apostle Paul says it best in uh, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, somewhere around about the, uh, the ninth, 10th verse, somewhere around there, it says, when I was a child, mm-hmm. I thought as a child, I speak as a child, mm-hmm. I understood as a child, but when I became mm-hmm. a man, wait, I think that it comes a place that you begin to grow up and you stop playing the games that you played when you were in the world, when you were in the flesh, when you were just doing enough to get by thinking that you mm-hmm. would feel safe. There's a time when, you, when your walk is, you sense that your walk may be threatened. And because, and I say that because I had an experience, oh, some 15, no, some 27 years ago. And I, I've shared it before. I won't go into all the details. But when I was doing what I was doing in the presence of the Lord, lifted off of me that I got myself together and walked and, and you know, and began to run up the street crying to the Lord saying, you know, hey, you, you can, there's a lot of things that you can do, but, but leaving me is not one of the things you can do. And it made, some, it made me reevaluate myself and not just reevaluate myself, but recommit myself. Uh, to the Lord because his presence, his presence is greater than any peace or any other thing that I can get for myself. I would rather him and what he would have for me than what I would want for myself because I'm still confident at, at all, after all this time that God only seeks to add the very thing that I've been trying to earn. My goodness, that's something to think about. Really, that is something to think about. We have just a couple of minutes. We're not going to go around the table for closing remarks. I'm just going to, and, I, and whatever you, and I'll just say any final thoughts. I'm not going to put this in order. 
as you feel in your spirit. I don't want to use the word feel led because we get too churchy sometimes trying to be deep. And it is a discussion that requires debt or should be a discussion of debt, but I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm a little different these days, but, you know, anybody got anything they want to say before we close? Brother Rich, I will. I, I, I have something to say. Yes, sir. I've heard, I've heard the statement several times tonight mm-hmm. that David was a man after God's own heart. Mm-hmm. And we have thrown that in with this discussion of dirty laundry. Okay. But but truthfully, God does not make this statement about David being a man after his heart until years later. Truth. He was not the man of God's heart. And I'm not even going to say what made him a man after God's own heart tonight. But let us not be confused that when we talk about David in this light, we're talking about a man that was wrestling with himself opposed to doing the will of God. Okay. He does not become the great man of God's heart. Until years later, let's keep that in mind. Okay. Anybody else? Well, we are very quiet tonight. Well, all right then, Sister. Kim, I just want to say. Song. Go ahead. Well, I just want to say um, I love what um, Apostle Smith just said um, mm-hmm. that he didn't become a different. He didn't get that title until he was actually actually changed. You know, he was after God's own heart, and that's one thing I love about the Lord. He gives you a new name when you have been redeemed. But my point is that a lot of people think that when they see us or season seasonal believers or people who are in the church that we're perfect. I'm just proclaiming that I'm not mm-hmm. perfect. By all means, I don't just go around and sin, sin, sin. I'm letting people know, hey, it took a process to get me here. I am not perfect. I, my thoughts are not always focused on the Lord. So that's a sin. So my point of my testimony on this subject is to let people know that there is a process. You grow in grace, grow in mercy, and then you offer those to um, important items to people because we are the church. <laughs> it's not the building. The building is where you get to exercise and your spiritual muscles mm-hmm. build up based on the angel of that church. But I just want people to understand that, you know, it's a growing grace. You know, we all get a different name. We all get a, a, different, uh, a different role. We all will be different. We have that glorified body. Our bodies won't be the same when we do see our King Jesus. Um, so that is the reason why I, I, I really believe in being real when it comes to my walk. It's because when I was growing up in the church, people would be one way and then another way. Where what you see with Kimmy Kim is what you get. I'm real 100%. So I want to tell you if you want to know my story. But I'm not just going to um, pretend like I have never done anything. I really believe there is mm. uh, power in discovering who you are and who you once were, and then people can really relate to you. Because if you're proclaiming yes. that you're super, super, just all the time, you can relate to the least, the less, and the lost, and the homeless, and the broken people. That's right. Because they think you're too Amen. perfect for them. They're intimidating. And that's why I love evangelizing because I can really be real to people. But I love everyone. Be blessed. All right. Anybody else before I bring this to a final close? Get our song ready, Sister Kim again. Nobody? Amen. I just wanted to say, I'm just going to uh, kind of piggyback off of uh, Dr. Kimmy Kim. And, you know, the Bible says that he takes the weak things to confound the wise. And I've been reading. Also, in uh, Jeremiah, the 18th chapter about the potter's wheel, 
And you know, God, uh, the pot, the potter was was marred in the hand of the Lord. And just because you're in the hands of the Lord and God has you uh, in His hand, doesn't mean that you don't have areas in your life that are marred, but you're still in His hand. And so we have to remember that we have to allow God to perfect us and to mold us into what he wants us to be. That even with the marred, even with the challenges, even with the things in our life that are not pleasing to God, God still is working those things for our good so that he can get the most glory. So I just want to say to someone that may be challenged, may be struggling, having challenges in their flesh, in that, in that natural uh, man, because the Bible says no such thing dwelleth in the flesh. Uh, don't allow the enemy to let you have guilt and shame and you get out of the will of God and you get out of, out of the potter's hand. Stay in his hand. Stay in church. Stay with God. Because even with your challenges, you're still in the hand of God and God still has a purpose for you. So even with those 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 issues that you are struggling with, that you're challenging with, God is molding you and making you. And that is a part of it that God continues to mold us and make us. And I was thinking today that Moses was a murderer. You know, um, David uh, you know, had his challenges of murder. Different ones had issues in the Bible, but God still used them. And, you know, I think that when we come out of, of, of being so spiritual and begin to see that God uses those things or those imperfections in our life for his glory, not that he wants us to continue with sin, that grace may abound, because uh, the scripture says, God forbid, but God takes our life and takes our experiences that he may get the most glory to so where we are forgiven much, God's grace so brighter in us. So we just want to be that example so that he can get the most glory out of our lives. Amen. Amen. Let me say this, and we'll come to a close. When we talk about dirty laundry, the first, uh, the first set of laundry we need to look at is our own. We don't look at another's because of the fact that there's enough of our own to if we were to take the time to get to clean out our closets that we wouldn't have time to worry about anybody else. For those of you, and I like what you said, I heard both, uh, uh, I heard the three of you. I like what you said, uh, Sister Kimmy Kim, and I think you said it as well, uh, Pastor Henderson. The truth of the matter is, We've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And when our dirty laundry comes up, we have to allow, we overcome by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. Do not forget, beloved, and I'm going to close with this. I believe it's First Peter chapter 4, verse 12, which says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing had happened to you. Verse 13 tells us to rejoice, not because we've come and escaped the trial, the tribulation, the trouble, the persecution, not because we have escaped, but rejoice because our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. What does that mean? There was a product on the market called OxyClean which when you put it in the laundry, it's supposed to make your whites even whiter and your brights even brighter. Through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, your name came into the book of life because of the fact that you allowed the Lord to clean you from the inside out. Your flesh is going to do what it does. My brother, my sister, fret not yourself. Don't beat yourself into the ground. Get back up. I'm Pastor Ernest E. Richard Jr. We hope you got something out of today's uh, podcast. We want you to be considered. Those of you who are saved, examine yourselves. Ask the Holy Spirit to search you. See where you're walking in error. See where you're going.